coordinated transaction with a few friends of mine to build a gaming table in turn for installing a water heater in my house. So I've seen this design floating around the DIY community for a little while. And I like this design, but it has a few long-term issues to think about. There are a few common mistakes in the DIY community that I have seen over time that I'd like to discuss in this video. The first thing to note is the type of lumber you use. Now, there's, there's, this is the lumber I've chosen for the gaming table. Uh, there's nothing wrong with using cheap lumber. In fact, I usually use cheap lumber. But when you use the cheaper stuff, there are a lot of issues that can arise, and I'll show you what I mean. The first thing I do whenever I get new lumber into the shop is I bring it into the shop and I clamp it all down so that it stays uh, so that it stays flat. You'll notice even this board here that since I didn't clamp these down, it still ended up warping over just the end. The middle of the board is all flat because it dried flat, but this one here warped up on me, and so I'm going to have to worry about that when I make these cuts to avoid this little bit of a bend here. One of the most important things to consider is your wood selection. Whenever you buy lumber, this is normally the type of configuration you'll see, where the wider boards usually don't have the knot in them, sometimes they will. What you'll normally find is that they cut the 4x4 four four out of the center, so, so the very center of the tree uh, is always going to be inside the 4x4. Four four. Whenever you buy a 4x4, four four, you can expect that you're going to get cracks in it. Because when the wood dries, this white wood will shrink, what they call tangentially, to the grain. So it'll shrink this direction because it's losing moisture, and you'll always end up with a crack wherever the smallest point is. This spot here, this line, is the close has is the shortest distance to the edge of the board. You may get cracking out here, and in fact we got a little bit of cracking here and here. But mostly whenever you're trying to get something you want a nice finish with no cracks, always avoid this board. Usually you'll get the 4x4 four four right out of the center of the tree. Sometimes you'll see it more in this type of configuration, where, let's see, this would be up here farther, where the knot is right in the center. You end up with the exact same crack in the center of the tree when it's on a board like this, and you also get a ton more warping. There's no way to get away from this warping except for letting the wood dry for several years, literally years, uh, and then planing it down when you're done. So the best thing to do when you're selecting your wood is to avoid that at all costs. Ideally, what you want is something like this, that is almost straight grained. This is still a, a flat sawn board, but it's, it's farther out on the tree, and you're going to get a lot better material out of that. Whenever you get uh, two by sixes, the best thing to avoid is getting the large two by twelve pieces, because usually they're something like this, but they come all the way out, out here. And this will still warp over time. You can see there's a tiny bit of a curve on here which doesn't seem like much, but when you're expecting boards to lay flat, they will never lay flat. They will always have a rock to them, no matter what you do. So the best thing you can do is buy thinner boards, two by sixes at most, in my, my opinion, and try to get straight grained. If, you, if you're worried about any kind of wobble, get straight grained. Now when you get into the four by four, we're gonna be using four by four legs later in the project. If you don't want any of this kind of cracking, don't buy 4x4s, buy, fours, buy two 2x4s, two and then when you glue them together, you can either glue them or just screw them together, you don't even have to glue them together, they will counteract against each other and you won't get nearly as bad a warping. Even if you glue them together wrong, it'll still be better off in the long run than buying a 4x4. Four four. mistake I see a lot of people make is they don't let their lumber dry properly. If you're buying lumber from the uh, from one of the big box stores, it is going to have moisture in it. So when you get your lumber, feel free to just, just clamp it up, wait two or three weeks to see what happens to the wood, but see how it reacts. Once it starts to curl, you're no, you know that it is starting to dry. If it stops moving, if it stops curling at any given point, it may be done drying, but you're gonna have to let it acclimate to your shop to make sure that it's not gonna warp once you cut your pieces. Once you cut your pieces, if it warps then, you may be out of luck. You may have to just make the piece out of another board. It's a very quick way to run out of material. I'll show you how I go about doing this. So this here is called a moisture meter. This is the tool I use to determine whether or not my wood is ready to go. What you normally wanna see is 5% in your wood. 5 to 7%, it all depends on what type of wood you're using, what your, uh, what your humidity is that you're expecting to move the piece into. 
If your house is a very damp place, then your wood is most likely going to warp once you bring it in. If it is an incredibly dry place, then it may warp the other direction. So it's something to note. But most of the time, what you're looking for is right around 5%, and that, that would be relatively stable. So the way this works is I just go up here. Okay, so we're at about 5.3 on that one. That's pretty good. 5.1. Looks like about 5.1. So it looks like all this wood is ready to be used. So I'm going to be changing up the dimensions of this table. Uh, we're changing it to, I think it was 42 by 78. So what I want to do is I want to cut the, I want to cut the material that determines the length first so I can build everything off of that. Since this is going to be one of the longer pieces, I want to get the straightest piece that I have, which appears to be this one here, that at, uh, and use it as the basis for everything else. So this is going to be the key piece to keeping the entire piece straight. So we got to make sure this cut is accurate. You can easily do something like this with a circular saw if you have one, but I'm going to be using my miter saw just because it's easier. Okay, so now that I have these down to a more manageable size, I'm going to go ahead and start cutting the 45s on them. This is a perfect opportunity to get rid of any kind of uh, nonsense that you have in there, any kind of knots or things that you want to get rid of. You're going to be cutting the side, the corner off anyway, so get rid of any flaws that you don't like. Okay, my mark is exactly at 78. I decided to go ahead and lay out all of my parts right now. I have the pencil holders and I have the cup holders that I'm going to cut out for this. And I want to do that now before I put them together because it's going to be a lot easier to do it now than it will be to do it later. All right, so I could have easily cut this with the uh, jigsaw over there, but I decided I wanted to use the circle cutter because I'll get a much better, uh, much better finish with it. Alright, to make sure I have a nice clean edge here that uh, will look real nice from the top, you gotta make sure that these are completely level. The jigsaw is not the best tool for making straight lines. So, go out, get yourself a file. These are only about $5. They, they're incredibly cheap and they are indispensable. Do not skip this step. This is what's gonna make the whole thing look nice and clean up from the top. So I have this mocked up to show how some of these joints are going to turn out and what I thought was going to happen pretty much happened where a lot of these joints ended up with a tiny little bit of a crack here. Now the joinery itself is actually very accurate. There's nothing wrong with the cuts I made because I referenced off of either the inside or the outside edge for the cut. So the cut is completely 45 degrees, 100% accurate uh, to the board itself. But the problem is, is if you change your reference, if I cut off of this one and then cut off over here, any kind of undulation in the wood is going to cause a tiny bit of an off cut. So this 45 is not necessarily an exact 90 degrees from this 45, but I can show you how we can fix that later on.
So as you can see, I neglected to clamp these together to keep them from warping. This one specifically is just awful, so it's not going to be used in this project. I'll have to figure something out. I think I might be able to get all of the inside framing out of just these two pieces, um, but as I install them, I'm going to have to push them more flat. There's not much else I can do about that. That's what happens when you use cheap materials, but it's not a big deal. I can make these work. These are probably just going to be used in some future project, probably some future shop project. So I decided I wanted the uh, inside framing, the longest pieces of the inside framing to be the straightest. And so I am cutting those first out of that section of the material. I'm going to cut both these at the same time, just to make it easier. Okay, so it's only been about an hour since I glued these together. Technically, I can work with it. It would have been better if I waited two hours, but I want to go ahead and do this while the glue is still just a little wet. Um, if you have glue inside one of the holes, and then you sand over it, it will hide any of those imperfections. Ooh, electricity helps. All right, so this is the top of my panel. These are all my good, nicely sanded edges. Uh, I'm going to start with the inside framing to make it easy. That way I have a reference to work with. Okay, and then I want to make sure this here is nice and flush. Oh, that's perfect. This one only costs about ten dollars, so I'll, uh, that's why I'm going to be using this one. Okay, so here's a better view of what's going on. I do not want any kind of gaps like this around the corners. It doesn't have to be perfectly flat. I'm going to aim for flat, and whatever I get, I get. But what I don't want is any kind of sharp gaps where I'm going to be getting light or air in through. I just want to make it look nice and flat, so that when I put the plywood down, uh, you're not going to be able to see any of it. So all you do is. is uh, Anytime you're going to be doing woodworking, I would highly suggest keeping one of these around. They're only about $10. I got this one $10 at Menards. It's really worth it. Uh, just for little things like this. Once the box is completed, it's really hard to run power tools in here. You could use a belt sander if you really wanted to, but this, this, is, this is the tool. This is the one you're going to want to use. All you got to do is just follow the grain. flush and go to the rest of the corners. So it turns out while I was putting this together I missed uh, I missed two of my corners. They didn't quite cinch up right where I wanted them to. So I'm going to I'm gonna have to patch this the same way I've been doing the rest of them. And this once again comes down to however you're going to finish it. Whatever your finish is going to be dictates how you're going to be patching these, whether you're going to be using a colored putty, or if you're going to be using a transparent finish, you can go ahead and use the sawdust method. There you go. Nice and patched. So when I, when I 
measured this box corner to corner, I found that it is about an eighth of an inch less in one direction than the other, which means it's not exactly square. So when I cut this plywood, I cut it just a little bit. I just round it up to the nearest uh, inch. So it's probably about an eighth over on all sides. Um, it won't matter. No, it, no one's gonna see that on the inside of the box. I really don't care. Framing that I cut for the bottom. I want to have three main supports just in case anyone wants to lean in the middle of the table. I don't want it to break. I want you to be able to climb on this thing when it's done. That's the goal. But don't climb on it. Hard. longer since the last shot. Video magic. So these are the legs all glued up. Since I have the opportunity, I want to run these over the jointer to clean up one side, and I'm going to run the other side over the table saw to clean up these raised edges. None of that is necessary. If you wanted to skip this step, you could. You would just have to be a lot cleaner than I was with the glue. start to find out all of the things you did wrong up until this point. I was supposed to put framing boards, framing 2 by 4s in this spot right here for structures, st structural stability, uh, and I didn't. So what I had to do was put chamfers along these boards so that I could pop them in. Not that big of a deal, but I really wish I had done it right. Oh 
Okay, so off camera I decided to cut all these bolts down to size and they fall right on that lip I made earlier. Now at this point I have a decision to make. Um, I could easily just leave my 2x6s right here just like that and the table would function just fine uh, just like that. But um, these all, no matter what you do you're always going to have uh, warping over time. Uh, every wet season, every dry season that you have you're going to end up having twists and bows and you're always going to have these hard transitions from one side to another. There's just a lot of things you're not going to be able to do with the table the way it is. The other problem is that you're going to end up with so many individual boards to keep track of and if you don't ever put them back on the table, which may happen, uh, it's, they're just going to be in the way. So what I decided to do was take some of this uh, framing material. These are basically just furring strips. You can buy these at any home center. And I drilled a bunch of holes in them and I'm going to use this as framing. These are going to go underneath the tabletop because this is my nice side. I want to screw them all in underneath and I'm going to glue the panels together. That way I'll end up with two major panels to keep track of. Also with the framing in there it's going to have a lot less, it will be a lot less likely for them to twist and warp and bend. So hopefully this will fix that problem. underneath the entire piece. Um, uh, I don't want any screw holes showing so I'm going to be put, putting brad nails in instead of any screws. Okay, so with the legs, this is what I decided to do. This is going to sit in here right like this. It's going to pull really tight this way. I'm going to have two bolts for each leg at, uh, at kind of a 45 degree angle coming in right here. One thing I decided to do was to leave just the tiniest little bit of a gap, just a little bit of a sixteenth of an inch gap right here because I don't want to push against this surface. I want to reference directly off of this 2x4 because I know it's straight. So all of my vertical force is going to be pushing on the 2x4 and my horizontal force is going to be pulling this piece together. Now you can just as easily do this with a hand drill, but I decided I wanted to use the drill press because I want a certain amount of uh, repeatability. Uh, if I can, I'd like these legs to all be interchangeable, that way I don't have to mark which leg is which. Uh, if you use a hand drill, you'll have to kind of custom fit every single one to the piece, and I'd like to avoid that if I can. There we go. At this point, I have a few options. Now, I can easily just come in here and drill out the hole with this size bit. The problem is, is because of the amount of space that I have, I end up at an angle. Uh, I don't want to put the hole at an angle if I can help it. So what I do have, what I do have is this longer bit that I think if I come way out here and use it instead, I'll be able to keep it a lot straighter in both directions. The other part of this is I want to put a backer on the back of this and clamp everything together so that nothing moves. Because as soon as I pull through that other side, it's going to rip out the back of my material and leave an ugly hole. And since this is going to be visible from the front of the from the front of the bench, I'd rather avoid that uh, if I can. Way 
through. Perfect. Exactly what we wanted. Right, now we need to push. Pull through. I'm just going to sink these right into the wood. I'm not going to worry about it. to round over all the edges, just give them a slight ease over. Not, nothing too extreme, just enough to where when you touch it, it's not going to feel sharp. You want it to feel somewhat rounded. That also gives you a slightly better level of uh, professionalism. So I went over everything with the sander just to flatten everything out, make sure it was all nice and even and everything was flush with everything else. And then I took it apart and went over everything once with some sandpaper. Now what I need to do is get all of that excess sawdust off of there. And the best way to do that is just to use an old t-shirt. This will get all that sawdust off of all the surfaces that you need to stain before the finishing process. So there are as many ways of finishing a wood project as there are ways of building these projects. Um, but I'm gonna show you my method and why I use it. The, one of the first and most important things to know is to use a, a wood conditioner. Because this will give you a much different effect. When you put a stain in, all of the wood will accept the stain at different amounts. If there's not, it's gonna it's gonna repel some of that uh, some of that stain. If it's a soft spot on the wood, it's gonna absorb more. So you're gonna end up with a very splotchy coating of the stain if you don't use a conditioner. So definitely use a wood conditioner. The second part of that is I would say do not use. Let's see. Ugh. Do not use an oil stain. Oil stains are just terrible when you're using wood glue. Anytime you get wood glue on the surface of your wood, even if you sand it off and it looks clean and perfect, once you put the oil stain on there, it'll penetrate into there, but it will not penetrate wherever the glue had touched. Anything the glue has touched will not take the stain and you're gonna end up with light spots on your project. And so what I like to do is use a gel stain. And the reason that is different is because it's actually a transparent top coat. Um, you're basically looking through this onto the wood. It's incredibly durable. It won't flake off. I do. I, I love the Minwax uh, gel stains. Those are one of my favorites to use. 
Um, once you put a coat of that on there, sometimes you can go and do a second coat if you've missed anything. Uh, try not to miss anything because it'll also make it look a little bit more splotchy. The next thing that I like to use to make it much more durable is shellac. I'm not a big fan of polyurethanes because they have a tendency to make things feel plasticky. But with the shellac, you, you end up, it still feels a lot like wood. It feels like a real table, it'll feel like a real piece of furniture if you use shellac over polyurethane. But if you want an extra level of professionalism, you can always go one extra step and use some sort of finishing wax. This finishing wax is actually much darker than I want, so if I end up using a wax on this, um, I'm probably going to end up getting something lighter. Also, you don't need to put this on the entire table, but if you want the top of the table to pop and have that extra level of professionalism, a wax is definitely the way to go. You can just put it on, you polish it out, and then just wipe off all the excess, polish it really good, and it will make your table look so much better in the end. Okay, so for me, this is going to be the scariest part of the entire process, because I've never done this process. What I need to do is glue down all of this EVA foam to the base here, and I don't, I don't work with EVA foam very often, so what I did is I did a couple practice pieces. These are the pieces that are going to be going underneath. I went ahead and pre-drilled and made some boards that can go up underneath to be screwed right in. So these will be nice and clean once I'm done. Those are gonna be the last thing that go in. So those are kind of a practice. So my goal is to coat the bottom of the foam and the wood here with this contact cement, and then once it's dry, I can stick them together, and hopefully I won't end up with too many major seams. I'm gonna see if I can do this without making any seams at all. That's gonna be incredibly difficult. What I'm probably going to do is I'm probably going to glue these down one at a time, something like this. I can put these in place to keep the two surfaces from touching. As soon as the two surfaces touch, you're kind of stuck with whatever you've done. So the idea is you can push this in, and you can take the dowels out one at a time as you press it down and work it into place. Alright, one thing to notice whenever you're using this EVA foam is that as soon as I put the contact cement on it, this is about a 16 inch piece of wood, and when I put the contact cement on the EVA foam and I let it dry the way you're supposed to, the foam soaked it up and actually extended uh, along, or ext extended past the edges of my wood about a quarter inch on each side. So, so the foam basically extended about a half inch over the course of roughly 16 inches here. So if you're going to be using contact cement with foam, you can just assume that it's going to extend. So this piece is just going to sit in here just like that. 